Welcome to the lab. As you know, Martin, fluorine is very, very different to any of the other elements, and the typical chemistry that we do is very different to the synthetic chemistry that the majority of the organic chemists or the inorganic chemists will do. So we use a metal vacuum line as opposed to a glass vacuum line, and the reason behind that is associated with the aggressive reactivity of fluorine. All fluorine lab labs around the world have developed their own methodology and techniques for handling fluorine, so this is very much a Leicester uh, mechanism that Professor Holloway before me has actually developed. So basically the easiest way to visualize this is this is just a hollow tube. It's a hollow tube made of metal. It's got a couple of traps which we can then cool to move manipula manipulate materials and move them from one place to another. And it looks quite complicated but basically you can imagine this is a mirror in the middle here. So you've got two sides of the line so you can do different manipulations on different sides. When I talk to the students about this, I refer to the two gauges here as the eyes of the apparatus. The point being, this is a metal apparatus, we can't see into it, so what these are telling us is that the system is under vacuum. As we introduce the gas, as I'll show you in a minute, the pressure will go up, and that allows us to therefore follow what's happening and understand what's happening. The valves are basically on-off uh, closure valves, and we have a set of uh, pumping systems the lower half is connected through to a, a, a pump on the, floor, on the floor there, and the trap is filled with soda lime. So what this does is this removes any of the fluorine from the exhaust vapor so it doesn't go through into the vacuum pump. So we'll get rid of our fluorine that way, and then once we've removed all the fluorine and the volatiles, when we want to increase the vacuum in the system, then we'll go up into the glass apparatus and we have an old-style mercury diffusion pump, again connected to a vacuum pump on the floor. So basically, majority of the gubbins, majority of the equipment is there to allow us to manipulate and handle the fluorine safely. We don't have a, a fluorine cylinder in the lab. We have a, a, a facility on the roof, a, a high pressure facility on the roof which allows us to transfer from a high pressure cylinder from the manufacturer to a lower pressure apparatus. And so we have these storage containers. So this is where our fluorine is at the moment. This is a uh, one and a half litre nickel can nickel is resistant to the fluorine and this allows us to then uh, introduce fluorine into our apparatus and this is sort of plumbed in. So it's very similar to a, a slank line that will have a nitrogen plumbed into it except we have fluorine plumbed in as well as our inert gas. The fluorine's up on the roof uh, from a, a safety perspective as far as I'm concerned. If we can maintain uh, effectively a, a lower inventory of fluorine in the laboratory where people are working then if there is a problem associated with uh, a release of, of this very aggressive gas, then uh, it minimizes the hazard and the risk to those individuals. So basically that's a, a, a one, one and a half litre can. Uh, we fill it to about 10 atmospheres of pressure, so you can see very clearly that we've got about 15 litres of gas. If that is all released into the laboratory, it would still be fairly dangerous, but it would be much less dangerous than the full, full cylinder supplied from one of the cylinder manufacturers. People are frightened of fluorine because it has this image and this reputation, and it is a very, very aggressive reagent. However, if it is controlled, manipulated and understood, in my view, it is no more hazardous to the operator, the individual, than other things. And, it, uh, and what frightens me more are some of the uh, very uh, volatile organic solvents, ether, etc., which can catch fire, some of the very aggressive organometallic reagents, which can catch fire. I'm actually more comfortable handling fluorine and fluorides than perhaps I would be handling some of those things. The reason it's so reactive is because in the F2 molecule, you have two fluorine atoms, but the bond between them is very weak. So you don't require much energy to break the bond. But the fluorine atom can then react with something else, for example, sulfur, to make a very strong bond. So you're breaking very weak bonds and making very strong bonds. And so you release a lot of heat. So fluorine will react with most things, giving out heat and sometimes light because it gets so hot. Quite unusually, it will react with the elements in its own group. So you can get fluorine will react with bromine or iodine or even chlorine. And oxygen can also react with its own other members of its group, but most other elements can't. So fluorine 
is really hungry for electrons and when it gets electrons it releases energy and that's the recipe for really quite explosive reactions. Fluorine, because it reacts so violently, doesn't form a huge range of compounds. So if you are a fluorine chemist, it's quite difficult to make new fluorine compounds. So if you're a young chemist setting out to make your name in chemistry, it's quite hard to find enough new fluorine compounds to make your name. The only area where this doesn't apply is organic fluorine compounds, compounds with carbon with fluorine attached to them. And many of the latest pharmaceutical drugs contain carbon fluorine bonds, which give interesting properties and enable the drugs to do things which they wouldn't be able to do without fluorine. But this really is the area of organic chemistry and the people who are discovering these drugs don't make the fluorinated compounds themselves, they just buy in the ingredients from somebody else who's reacted the fluorine with the carbon.